Scott Helmers is a Vizio MVP and author of Vizio 2013 Step by Step. He's an IT consultant and an application designer who's con constantly fascinated and energized by the power of Microsoft Vizio. He builds custom Vizio solutions and advises clients on appropriate uses of technology to solve business problems. You can purchase a copy of Vizio 2013 Step by Step by visiting VizioStepbyStep.com or you can enter to win your very own autographed copy from Experts Exchange. And I'll be sending out the information on how to enter to win in the next few days. I'm now going to hand the presentation over to Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. As we make the screen transition, um, you should see Brittany's slide change into mine as soon as I share my desktop here. I don't seem to have a desktop control yet. There we go. Okay, so now you should be seeing a set of slides from my desktop. Um, I do want to say thank you to Brittany and to Experts Exchange for offering me the opportunity to present to all of you this afternoon. And just to echo what Brittany said a moment or two ago, I would encourage you to ask questions. Um, I will definitely try to leave some time at the end in order to be able to answer as many questions as possible. But for those that we aren't able to answer on the air, we will definitely, uh, I will uh, type up answers and we will provide those to everyone afterwards. What I plan to do in the next uh, 50 minutes or so is to talk about a lot of the behind the scenes things in Visio. I suspect because many of you are here, you're probably here because you, you've already used Visio. You know a little bit about it or maybe you know a lot about it. But what I want to do is talk about some of the distinctions between some of the terms that you've heard uh, like shapes and masters, stencils and templates. Um, I want to talk about some of the very valuable ways that you can manage the user interface to make Visio do your bidding even more easily and quickly than you might have uh, been aware of in the past. We'll talk about something called the Visio workspace, and I'll show you some of the implications of what that workspace is and, and how you can control it. My, my primary motivation for a lot of what I'm going to be doing with you in this hour is, is to talk about control and giving you more control. Um, we'll talk about customizing the user interface, customizing the, the ribbons in Visio 2013, uh, as well as customizing the quick access toolbar and some of the other behind the scenes options that you can set. We'll talk about the developer tab. Now, you may or may not be a developer. You may not ever want to write a line of code in your life. But even so, there are some things on the developer tab that will make you a, a better Visio user and, and will turn you, uh, push you over that edge from being a user to being a power user. Once we have the developer tab enabled, we can talk about and demonstrate something called the document stencil. You're all familiar with regular stencils. I want to show you what's similar and what's different about the document stencil. Um, we'll talk about creating new shapes of your own. Uh, most of us have used any of the many thousands of shapes that are available in Visio stencils. Some of you may also have downloaded stencils from the web from various manufacturers of, of uh, networking hardware or other kinds of shapes that you might have downloaded. Well, you may also want to create your own, and I'll show you uh, some techniques for doing that. Uh, well, once you've turned a shape into a master and understand how to do that, I want to show you a little bit about editing the masters. And uh, that will actually come back and, and uh, so we'll circle back around to that thing called the document stencil that was on the previous slide because there's some direct interactions um, that are useful to know about. And then we'll, we'll uh, conclude with a discussion and demonstration of something called the shape sheet. I'll talk a little bit more about what that is when we get there, but you'll understand uh, what the formulas embedded in the shape sheet are all about what the functions, what fun kinds of functions are available, and see how that affects what you can do in Visio. So again, it's all about understanding what's a little bit, uh, you know, what's at the second and third level behind the obvious parts of Visio. That's my focus for today. Let's begin with some of the terminology and uh, as befitting Visio, because it is a visual application and a visual tool, I want to uh, define a couple of these terms for you using some pictures. So here's a screenshot of Visio 2013. 
Um, it has the same look and feel as the rest of the Office suite, uh, the Office 2013 suite. So if you like the whiteness of Office 2013, then you'll love Visio 2013. If not, then there are some ways you can adjust and change the contrast. Um, personally, I like the whiteness to some degree, but I tend to make everything look the same. So there are, there are some things that, will, uh, that I'll show you that you can use, uh, techniques you can use to, to alter that visual appearance a little bit if you want to. So here's, a, here's that screenshot then. What does the drawing window look like? Well, it, that's, that's the main part of Visio. That's where you work all the time. You may or may not have, have thought of it as a separate part of Visio, but it actually is the, the primary window, one of many windows, however, that are available in Visio. In addition to the drawing window, there is the, the shapes window. Uh, that's where the stencils live. And in this particular case, I've opened a network diagram, and the uh, stencils that are there on the left include things like computers and monitors, detailed network diagram, and so forth. It's that collection of stencils that uh, exists inside the shapes window. When you use a template, what is a template in Visio? A template is nothing more or less than the set of windows that are open, uh, or it's a collection of windows that typically open when you, when you launch a new diagram from the template. Almost always, a template consists of the drawing window and the shapes window, which is why I've drawn this the way I have. Sometimes there will be other windows that will open. We'll, we'll take a look at some of those in a few minutes. But basically, a template consists of a drawing page that has certain dimensions, um, suitable for the type of diagram, it may be landscape orientation, portrait orient orientation, um, as well as some collection of stencils inside the shapes window. And then there's this thing called the workspace. The workspace consists of the full set of open windows, uh, of windows that are open at any given moment in Visio. I'm just going to ask you to put that notion of workspace on hold for just a minute. We'll come back and take a look at that when we get into Visio itself in just a moment. Two very commonly used words in Visio are shapes and masters. And I just want to make sure you're clear on the distinction between the two. A shape is an object on the drawing page. The Ethernet segment there is a shape. The server that I've drawn a, a gold uh, border around is a shape. Everything on the page is, is a shape. A master is what most of us use to create shapes. We drag a master onto the page, and that creates a shape. So technically speaking in Visio, a master is the object inside the stencil, and a shape is an instance of a master or a shape that you create freehand or on your own that lives on the drawing page. Now, having said that, I will tell you that many people, including longtime Visio users, will refer to shapes as any of these objects on the screen that you see, including the ones in the stencil. But just so you know what the correct terminology is, a master lives in a stencil, and a shape lives on the drawing page. Let's get to Visio, and let's take a look at Visio itself. Uh, this is Visio 2013, and this is what it looks like when you first launch it. I just happened to have clicked on it just before you, you uh, arrived. So this is the, the start page in Visio 2013. It looks a little bit different, same concept, but a little bit different from the other, uh, other previous versions of Visio. Over on the left here, we see recently used diagrams, um, a button at the bottom or a link at the bottom that allows me to open any other existing diagram that doesn't happen to be on the recent list. And then I have a bunch of thumbnails over here on the right for di different diagram types. All, these are all templates that I can use to create new diagrams. Um, I'm not going to spend much time here because there are other webcasts that I've done for Microsoft that you're welcome to, to search for. There are Visio tips and tricks sessions that I've done on Microsoft's behalf uh, include, that include things like a basic orientation to Visio 2013 and learning about all the different kinds of templates. Not going to do that today, but I just want to point out one thing on this page that's very helpful to know about, and that's the difference between the word featured and the word categories here. When you, ever you start Visio 2013, what is presented to you is the featured thumbnails. This display will change over time. This display actually learns which templates you use most often, and they sort of bubble to the top over time. So this display is dynamic. It will change. The categories display is actually more like what you're accustomed to if you've used previous versions of Visio. 
The categories include business, engineering, flowchart, and so forth. If you have Visio Standard, you'll see fewer of these. If you have Visio Professional, as I have, you'll see all eight of these template categories. Um, selecting a category like flowchart and clicking on it shows me thumbnails of all of the templates inside that uh, particular template category. But the key difference, uh, the key point I want to make is the difference between featured, which is a dynamic view, and categories, which is a static view that is most familiar to those of us who've used other versions of Visio. In my particular case, I'm going to go back to the featured set and I'm going to double click on basic diagram because I'm just going to use a very simple template uh, a couple of times during the course of this session. So now I have a drawing page that's open and I have a set of stencils that are open that give me basic shapes, arrow shapes, decorative shapes, and other, a couple of other choices. Before we get into creating a quick diagram and showing you some, th some things that uh, I will get to, I do want to talk a little bit about managing the user interface. Um, in particular, one of the nice features in Visio 2010, and that is also uh, available in, in true in Visio 20, uh, excuse me, in 2013, also true in 2010, is that you have the ability to manage the shapes window in a in a new way, and that's this little arrow that says minimize the shapes window. If I click that, the shapes window now takes up the absolute minimum amount of space. The descriptions are hidden. They're available if I hover, and you'll see pop-up text that describes what each of these shapes is. But the nice thing is, if you have a narrow screen or a, you know, a conventional screen rather than a widescreen monitor, um, this is a good way that you can still use the stencil. You can still drag shapes from the stencil out onto the page, but it takes up the minimum amount of space. You can always return it to its expanded size. And as always with previous versions of Visio, you can um, change the width of the shapes window um, in a way that, that leaves the descriptions on the screen. But this minimize button is a very handy thing for getting it together, uh, or, or pardon me, for having it take up the absolute minimum amount of space. Another thing that's uh, slightly different in Visio 2013 is if you click on more shapes, but this has always been here. You can click more shapes. You can uh, browse through a variety of other stencils if you want to open different stencils. The change in Visio 2013 is that when I select a particular stencil, let's say I want the, um, I don't know, the workflow objects stencil, notice that that workflow object stencil opened over on the left and a check mark appeared next to it but the little fly-out menu didn't go away. That allows me to open another stencil at the same time. So I don't have to constantly go back to more shapes, fly out, fly out, and then choose one. These little fly-out menus stay open until I end up clicking on the background or clicking anywhere else to close them. It's just a very minor thing, but it's a, a convenience feature. Um, which also reminds me, I did have one slide after my demo slide, so I'm going to go right back here to my slides for one second. I do want to make a point about the content I'm covering today. All of what I'm saying applies to Visio 2013, which is representing, uh, represented by this, this icon at the very top of the slide. Nearly all of what I'm going to show you today also applies to Visio 2010, because both of those versions of Visio use the ribbon user interface. Now, the, the user interface parts aside, all of the actual functions I'm going to perform actually do exist in um, nearly all of the previous versions of Visio. So most of what I'm going to tell you, probably 80, 80 or 85 percent of what I'm going to show you this afternoon, is available in Visio 2007 and even Visio 2003. UI stuff relates specifically to the newer two versions. All right, back to Visio. I mentioned the workspace. What the heck is the workspace? Well, I said it was a collection of windows. It's not just this drawing window and the shapes window, but other possible windows that we can open in Visio. What other windows are there? If I click on the View tab below Task Panes, we see that there's a Shapes window. Well, that is the Shapes window we're looking at. I can actually turn that off and turn it back on. So by the way, if you ever open a diagram and the Shapes window is not visible, click View, click Task Pane, and click on Shapes. There is the Shape Data window. Some of you may be familiar with that for shapes that have data. I'm going to turn it off for right now. I'm going to be using it again in a few minutes. Let's take the Pan and Zoom window, which is a, a handy window. If I've got a couple of different shapes on this page, let's just add, randomly add some, some shapes here. 
um, and I'd like to be able to zoom in, I can come to the pan and zoom window and draw a rectangle. I can resize that rectangle. I can zoom, use the little zoom slider here to zoom in and out as well. But the basic idea is that this pan and zoom window lets me orient what is visible and change what's visible very easily through the pan and zoom window, the little rectangle in the pan and zoom window. Now, this window then is part of the workspace. It's something I'm using as part of doing my, my work in Visio. Let me show you something that you might have noticed, you might not have. If I now save this diagram, and by the way, one other aside, notice when I save as in Visio 2013, my SkyDrive is here. If I have connections to any SharePoint sites, those will, will be right here as well. So Visio 2013 is integrated with external storage, cloud storage, if you will. Um, and so I can save as to my SkyDrive or a SharePoint site just as easily as I can save to my computer. I'm going to uh, save to the My Documents folder and just click the Save button. I'm drawing one already exists, so I'll overwrite it. So now I've saved my diagram. What I want to show you about the workspace is this. By default, Visio remembers what is in your workspace, the elements of your workspace. So if I now close my diagram and I click File, Open, and on my recently used list of diagrams is Drawing 1. So let me open it now. Notice that when I reopen it, the Pan and Zoom window reappears, as the Shapes window does as well, but the Pan and Zoom window reappears. When I saved my diagram, it was open, therefore Visio considers it part of my workspace, and it saves it for me. If you've ever had a problem with the Shapes window having disappeared, this is probably the reason. Uh, it may be that when you last saved your diagram, you saved it with the Shapes window closed. And as I just showed you a moment ago, if you, if you ever find yourself in that position, click View, click Task Pane, click Shapes, and you can bring it back again. There is a setting. I'm going to click File, Options. There is, uh, I'm sorry, not File Options, right on the Info tab that opens when I click File. Uh, there's a, a rather obscure setting in Visio. This is not my favorite part of the user interface design of Visio for sure. Over here on the right side of the screen on the Info page, you see a bunch of information about the document, including the author's name and the date and time and all that good stuff. There is the word Properties right here with a little tiny downward pointing triangle. If I click that and click Advanced Properties, which appears, I now see a dialog that may be familiar to many of you if you've used previous versions of Visio. In Visio 2007 and earlier, simply clicking File, Properties, just brought up this window, this dialog box. Um, here I can change things like the author and title and so forth. But what I want to show you at the moment is this checkbox at the bottom that says Save Workspace. By default, there is a check mark there, hence what I've shown you so far is uh, will remain true. If this is unchecked, either intentionally or otherwise, if, you, if it is unchecked, then the next time I save changes to my document, the workspace will not be preserved as it was. It will revert to whatever was in the save, last saved version of the document. So why am I going to great lengths to, to show you all this? I just want, it to be, I want you to be familiar with how to troubleshoot a problem if somebody says, hey, that window was open before and it doesn't reopen when I open my diagram or something like that. Uh, chances are it's related to the workspace and that option. All right, let me close the pan and zoom window, and let's go back to full screen view. And by the way, I just use a very, very handy keyboard shortcut. Um, let's zoom in. In fact, let me, let me just digress with a couple of quick keyboard shortcuts that are very handy. Hold down the Control Shift key. Notice the cursor changes from an arrow to a magnifying glass when I do that. Drawing with the control and shift key held down or dragging with the mouse with those two keys held down creates a view that as soon as I let go of the mouse is what is, is that, that zooms in to that view. So I can zoom in and zoom out that way very easily. Another very easy way to zoom in and zoom out is hold down the control key and just use the mouse wheel. Assuming your mouse has a wheel, you can scroll in and out uh, or zoom in and out with the mouse wheel very easily. The keyboard shortcut I started to mention is Control Shift once again, but press the W key. W as in whole page. Um, Control Shift W is 
one of the most commonly used Visio shortcuts for me because I'm constantly zooming in and, in and out to edit different parts of a diagram. Whenever I want to return to whole page view, control shift W. Now, caution, if you're using Visio 2007 or 2003, control W does the same thing. But the real caution is if you then move to Visio 2010 or 2013, control W will close your diagram which is kind of inconvenient. According to Microsoft, they made the change to control shift W for consistency across other applications in the Microsoft Office suite. So regardless, if you zoomed in, you zoomed out, control shift W in either 2010 or 2013 returns you to the whole page view. Now let's move on to talk about uh, customizing the user interface and making Visio do your bidding more easily. Um, here you see home, insert, design, a set of tabs that are standard in Visio, and you also see a developer tab. Now where did that come from? Unless you've explicitly turned it on, it's not on. Click File, Options, and in the Options dialog that appears, click Customize Ribbon. What I did to turn on that tab is I put a check mark next to the word developer. If you do this on your copy of Visio and you've never turned the developer tab on before, chances are about 100% that there, there will be no check mark there. I'll just to prove the point, let me click OK and notice now the developer tab goes away. So I have home insert, design data, process review, and view. Those are the standard tabs in Visio Professional. If, by the way, if you have a standard, you will not see either the data or the process tab. So tip number one, file options, customize ribbon, and turn on the developer tab. We'll come back and use that in a few minutes. But let's also do some other things that we can uh, do here. I'm going to close the expansion of the view tab because I don't need that at the moment. What I want to do is add my own tab. I want to I put some functions on my own tab so that they're there whenever I want them. I don't have to go searching anywhere else or looking anywhere else for them. To do so, I'm going to click the button that says New Tab. And I'm going to select my new tab, which is cleverly named New Tab, and click the Rename button, because I'd like to give it something a little bit more meaningful. I'm going to call it EE, in honor of Experts Exchange and this webcast today. Next, I'm going to click on Group. Now, as you know from looking at the ribbon at the top of the screen, the tabs in any of the Office applications um, have groups in, on them, and each group then has function buttons inside it. So this group is the only group in, on my new tab, and it's called New Group. Let's change that as well. Select it, click Rename, and now not only do I get to rename it, but I'm going to have a, a choice of icons. I'll come back to that in a second. Let's give it a name, something like Useful Stuff. The purpose of these icons is to uh, have something visible if you change the width of your window, the Visio window, sufficiently that it causes the, the group to, um, to collapse. If you've ever experimented with the ribbons in any of the uh, Office applications, you know that as you change the size of the window in which the application lives, some of the function buttons get smaller, some of them collapse into a uh, single icon. So let's just pick something arbitrary. How about a sort of violet colored? Square. Click OK. And now I have a tab called EE, a group called Useful Stuff, but no functions in it yet. So let's add some functions. That's pretty easy to do. We can choose from a set of what Visio considers to be popular commands here. Maybe I frequently want to draw lines, so I can select line and drag it over and put it in my Useful Stuff uh, group. There's also a set of commands that are not in the ribbon. Now, this is actually a pretty useful thing to know about because there are a slew of commands that did, just didn't fit on the ribbon anywhere. In fact, you can see as I scroll down here, there are a whole lot of them. So I'm going to choose a couple of those. One of my favorites is uh, this one that says Center Drawing. It does just what it sounds like, and I'll show you how that works in a moment. So I've just full stuff group. Um, how about um, another one for changing text. So you can you can put any kind of function here at all. Uh, this particular one I'm looking for is called small caps. There it is. So let's add that. And now I have three buttons, three functions in my tab. Let's click OK. 
my tab appears. Notice here it is. And it has three functions, line, center drawing, and small caps. If I click the line button, then I, have, I can draw a line. If I click on, um, let's go back to the home tab and turn my cursor back to the normal pointer tool. By the way, control one, the control key and the one key is a good keyboard shortcut for reverting back to the pointer tool. Let's take all this stuff that's on the page here and let's center it. Back to my EE tab. All I need to do is click on the button that says center drawing and Visio takes everything that's on the page currently and centers it both horizontally and vertically. And just to make that point even more obvious, let's drag it into the very corner of the page here and let's do that one more time. And sure enough, Visio does the math and drops everything into the center of the page. Let's take a, an example of uh, typing text. This is a comment on my shape. And let's see whether the small caps button works. Let's zoom in even tighter here, click small caps, and it's changed the font style from normal text to uh, small caps. I'm just picking three very different kinds of buttons to show you that you can put anything you'd like on your own custom tab. Back to file options, I also want to point out that there is a button that says import export at the bottom of the customized ribbons dialog. If you've created a set of customizations for the ribbon that you really like, and you want to use them on a different machine where you also run Visio, you can save them and then you know, export them from this copy and import them into the other one. Or if, heaven forbid, you should mess things up and decide, you know what, I really don't like this at all, notice the reset button. That will reset all of the customizations and put you back to where you started. So use, useful things to know about. Other things that you can do to uh, customize Visio, in addition to the tabs that are on the ribbon, there's also the quick access toolbar. Now, by default, it has a save button, a, uh, an undo, and a redo button. So you can uh, use those buttons simply by clicking on them. Personally, there are enough things that I like to do that are so common that I want to get at them all the time, very quickly, very easily. So I like to add them to the quick access toolbar. There are a couple of different ways to do that. This little down arrow I'm pointing to says Customize Quick Access Toolbar on the Tooltip text. What it includes is a list of very common functions that many people might like to add to the Quick Access Toolbar, like the Open button. And sure enough, now if I click on Open, the File Open dialog appears. I don't have to click File and then Open. Simply click once on this button. So here are some handy functions. A second way to add uh, useful things to the quick access toolbar is simply to find a function you like. I'm going to go to the review tab. Now I, I run reports a lot when I'm uh, using Visio because I tend to work with diagram types that uh, in which the shapes have data in them. And the, being able to get at that data via running a report is a very handy thing. And I occasionally forget whether the reports button is on the view tab or the review tab or the data tab. Well, it's on the Review tab, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put it on the Quick Access Toolbar. Any function button that exists on any toolbar, uh, on any current tab, simply right-click on it, and the very top entry is Add to Quick Access Toolbar. So now one click, and I've got the Reports button there. Click on it, and the Reports dialog appears. Again, it's all about making my life simpler. That's, that's all I'm, you know, that, that's my goal here. You can also customize the quick access toolbar, and you probably have noticed this, click file options, the same way we did to customize the ribbon, you can customize the quick access toolbar here as well. So you can just drag functions from here. Uh, maybe you like to group shapes pretty often, so let's add that function here. And when I click OK, that group button now appears on my QAT. Last bit of customization I want to show you has to do with a couple of other things that are on the file options dialog. Uh, we've looked at customized ribbon and quick access toolbar. On the general tab, you'll find a couple of things like changing your name and initials, um, changing the background. I mentioned that if you like the white on white sort of approach of the 2013 application, great. But if you don't, if you'd like to add a little bit more contrast 
to the user interface. You can choose dark gray, click OK, and now notice that the background around the ribbons and the toolbars um, are shaded as you ask. That's not really the most important thing I want to show you. That's handy to know about, and maybe I'll go with light gray because dark gray is a little too dark. What I really want to show you is not so much proofing, but one of the things is on save. The default in Visio is for auto recover to be turned off. So whenever you install Visio, auto recover does not happen. However, that's a pretty handy thing because if you're working along and you've made a lot of changes, you don't want to have to go back and have to redo them if something happens. So put a check mark here, set a time limit, and from now on every 20 minutes or every once an hour or whatever it is that you'd like to do, uh, you can set that value. And then finally on the advanced tab, there's a long list of things uh, here I can change on the advanced page, but I just want to point out a couple of them. Um, there's a feature in Visio 2010 and 2013 called Auto Connect that's very handy most of the time. Sometimes it's not. If it's not handy in a particular uh, the way you use Visio, you can turn it off. One of the things that I turn on very frequently is center selection on Zoom. This simple, simple check mark right here means that whenever I have one or more shapes selected and I change the zoom level, either by rolling the mouse wheel or any other technique, then the selected objects will be placed in the center of the screen. So I like that a lot because I know that when I change zoom levels, those shapes that are selected will automatically appear right where they're handy. Um, Lots of other things if you like to use undo a lot. The default in Visio is 20 levels of undo. You can change that and make lots more levels of undo available. So again, just things that you can do to, to make Visio your own. Um, let's do something a little bit different now. Oh, I'm sorry. I, there is one other thing, one very important thing I'm going to show you. I'm going to click File Options, and this time I'm going to click Add In. There is a long-standing problem with an add-in for Bluetooth. And I, to be honest, I don't even know why this add-in uh, is enabled in Visio and the rest of the Office suite. But the add-in is called Send to Bluetooth. And, and if it's active, you'll see it right at the top of this screen under Active Application Add-in. That Bluetooth add-in is incompatible with Visio. And it causes Visio to crash way too often and when you're doing very ordinary things, sometimes as, as simple as copy and paste, sometimes as simple as trying to save a diagram. So absolute positive recommendation, uh, whenever you install Visio, click File Options, click Add-ins, and then if you click down at the very bottom of the screen, you'll see this Go button. Um, Bluetooth is not here because I previously disabled it, but if it were, you would just select it, click Remove, and be done with it. Click OK. And now that Bluetooth add-in has been disabled for Visio. Let's take a little bit different example. Let me close my non no longer useful diagram here. Let's click File, New. And I'll use that same basic diagram template. Let's start a new diagram here. And I'm going to simply drag a circle onto the page. Nothing very revolutionary about this circle. But what I want to do is I want to customize this circle so that um, I can create a master from it so that I can reuse the changes, the customizations that I've made. So I'm going to do a couple of things here. First, I'm going to change the fill color. And we'll just change it to sort of a gold, gold color like that. Um, I'm also going to add some shape data. Click on the Data tab for those of you who have Visio Professional, you can just add a check mark here to turn on the sh to open the shape data window. If you don't have Visio Professional, you have Visio Standards instead, you can still get at the shape data. Simply right click, choose data, shape data, and that will open the shape data window as well. Now you can see that this circle shape does not have any data. Why might you want to add data? Well, maybe I'm going to create a diagram in which the um, names of the owners or the locations of these shapes on the diagram are important to record and be able to report on later. So I'd like to add some data to this shape. Easy way to do it over here in the shape data window, simply right click, choose define shape data, and that opens this dialog that lets me do just that. 
So I'm going to create a couple of data fields here. I'm going to create one called cost, and I'm this field. Notice I can use strings, numbers, lists, and so forth, uh, currency values, Boolean, basically a true or false setting. Uh, I'm going to go with a number here and create a cost field that holds numbers. If I wanted to give it an initial value, I could. If I wanted to provide some prompting text, so when a user is filling in data values for my shapes, they'll be prompted to uh, enter a value from 1 to 10, for example, whatever guidance you want to provide to them. Now I'm going to click the New button because I want to create a second field. And this time, I'm going to create a field called Location. This time, my field is this field is going to be a list. So I'm choosing fixed list. Now the idea here is a list type field will present the user with a drop down list. So what I want to do as the shape designer is I want to add some, I, I want to populate the drop down list, add some value to that list. To do that in the define shape data dialog box, click into the format tab and then type your list separated by semicolons. So I'm going to put Boston. Chicago, semicolon, and how about Seattle? Just to list three cities in my location field. Click OK. And now over in the shape data window, you see a cost field. And I can type in a number. In the location field, you see a drop down list from which I can choose Boston, Chicago, or Seattle. So I've accomplished my initial goal. I have a shape. It's got a custom color. It's got two data fields in it. Now what I want to do is create a master copy of this shape so that I can reuse it. To accomplish that, click on More Shapes and choose New Stencil. Notice, depending on your location in the world, you can create a new stencil in either US or metric units. I'll choose US. I now have a blank stencil window over here on the left side of the screen. And all I need to do to turn my stencil, uh, pardon me, to turn my shape into a master is drag it into the stencil. It, by default, is given a name master.something. First thing I'm going to do is right click and rename master, and I'm going to call it my circle. It's not very original, but it'll serve the purpose for the moment. So now I have a master shape called my circle. What can I do with it? Well, I can drag it onto the page, and look at that. The master stays behind, of course, because it lives in the stencil, but now I have a copy of it, an instance of it in which I can set a data value like Chicago and a cost factor of 123. If I drag another stencil, another shape from the stencil, then I can set its value. Maybe this one, this shape lives in Seattle. So two different shapes created from the same master, which master I created myself. Let's create a shape a different way. I'm going to go to the Home tab. And I'm going to click on the Drawing Tools drop-down, from which I can choose the Rectangle tool, the Ellipse tool, uh, and, and any of the other tools here. I'm going to choose the Freeform tool. This is kind of a fun little tool. Um, all I'm doing is moving my mouse around, I'm holding the mouse button down continuously, but moving my mouse around. Now, if I just draw this squiggle, it's a line. And I've created a line that has a particular shape to it. But here's a little trick. If I create a squiggle, that ends exactly where it began. So if I come back here, Visio turns that into a two-dimensional shape. So instead of having a 1D or one-dimensional shape, I now have a two-dimensional shape simply by drawing the end point on top of the start point. So what? Well, it's just another way to create a shape. Maybe you're going to create a, a kind of drawing in which you want a shape like this. So now I've got my, my shape here. I could change its color. I can do other things to it. But what I'm going to do is say, yeah, I like it the way it is. Let's drag it into my stencil so I can create a new master. Let's rename it. And let's call it Squiggle and use it. I can drag it on an instance onto the page, and there it is. So creating a shape is really very simple. What do you do once you've created a stencil that contains shapes with the new masters that you uh, have created from your shapes? 
Notice when I click on the header bar for this stencil, which is currently called Stencil 3, a little diskette appears. And if I hover, it says Save, Save Stencil. So let's click Save. And here's a tip for you. Visio, when, it ins when you install Visio on your machine, in your Documents folder, Visio creates a special folder called My Shapes. You're probably familiar with My Pictures, My Videos, and that sort of thing. The My Shapes folder is a repository for any shapes that you'd like to store there. So I'm going to click my sh double click My Shapes, and I'm going to create my uh, EE stencil. So now that stencil is on my machine for all time. If I open another diagram, I can click on More Shapes, My Shapes, and here's my EE stencil. Checkmark means it's already open in this particular diagram, but I can do that and open it in any diagram. All right, what else can we do? Um, now that we have um, seen how we can create masters, can we change them once we've created them? And the answer is yes. Let's right click on the squiggle and choose Edit Master. I can change the master properties. This lets me change the name, provide some other information about that master. I'm going to leave that the way it is. But let's right click again, choose Edit Master, and choose Edit Master Shape. This opens a separate drawing window in which my larger than life shape now exists. So what do I want to do to my shape? Well, let's, um, let's maybe I decide I don't really like that particular color, so I want to uh, assign a little bit different color. How about something with more of a gold sort of color? Um, you notice that live preview is in effect here, and as I hover over any other sort of uh, color scheme, the uh, shape automatically updates using the live preview. I get an, an, an advanced idea of what my changes are going to look like before I've made them. So I've changed the color. I can even change the size a little bit if I want to. Maybe I want to make this guy a little bit smaller. So let's uh, drag the, the corners in a little bit. I'm now going to click the X in the upper right-hand corner to close this window. Visio says, do you want to save the changes and update squiggle? And I say yes. And lo and behold, my master shape in the stencil now has my new color over here. If I drag a master, an instance of it onto the page, notice it is indeed smaller, and it has the new color. But also notice that the old version, the one that I created from the stencil a few minutes ago, retained its original characteristics. This is an important point. How, if, if let's say I, I've dragged a couple of these things onto the page here now, um, how can I change my master and have it affect the instances of the master? Well, just to prove the point once more, let me make one other quick change. Let's go back and edit that master, and let's change it to some other color, about um, the green color. Let's save the changes. Once again, I have changed my master. New instances reflect that change, but old instances do not. Why is that? Well, that brings us back to something that was in my agenda. It said. Um, there was a reference to something called the document stencil. Let's now go to the developer tab. Now, I said at the outset that you don't have to ever write a line of code in your life to want to use the developer tab. There's a lot of good stuff on here. Yes, some of it has to do with writing code, like writing macros and uh, com add-ins and, and so forth, things that we're not going to talk about today. But there are some other functions here that are very handy. We'll be using the shape sheet in just a moment. But right now, what I want to do is, turn, is open this thing called the document stencil. So simply put a check mark next to document stencil. Watch the left side of the screen as I do this. Now you'll see something called document stencil. This is different from my custom stencil. It's different from the stencils that we previously uh, that, that opened automatically when we used the basic diagram template. What is in the document stencil is the master copy for each shape on the page. Let's just prove that point. Let me go to the arrow shapes, for example, and I'll just randomly grab an arrow here, flexible arrow. Let's go back to the document stencil, and now you notice that the master for the flexible arrow is there. It wasn't there when we first looked at the document stencil. We see a master for circle, we see a master for my circle, and we see three different masters for squiggles. This one, 
and, and the color helps you identify which ones are which. But the point is this. If I changed my master in my own stencil, we saw that it did not change existing instances of that master. The key, if you do want to affect multiple instances, is to go to the document stencil. So go to the developer tab, go to check mark next to the document stencil, and then if you change a master here, let's right click, let's edit master, edit master shape, and let's change this blue one in some particular way. Let's, uh, let's select it and uh, we'll just right click on it. Um, we'll right click and we'll give it a sort of outline look with, with a, a clearer fill. Um, let's save that change. Remember, I've, I'm now updating a master in the document stencil and that dialog said, do you want to change the master and all instances? And look at this, the original squiggle that we dropped onto the page that used to be blue now reflects the changes made in the document stencil. Back in the EE stencil, we're still at the third iteration, the, you know, the third set of changes we made, we have this green squiggle. If I want to change all of the orange squiggles, I can do the same thing. I can update the master and so forth. Even something like shape data, if I went to my circle, and I right click and I edit master and edit master shape. Notice the shape data is here. I could add a new shape data field and that shape data field would be applied to all instances of that master. So this is, this is a very powerful concept and I hope that you, you can appreciate the distinction between making a change to a master in any old stencil versus making a change to a master in the document stencil. When you're finished with the document stencil, simply uncheck on the developer tab and you're now dealing with your primary stencils. Uh, I'll just remind you, uh, I, I haven't looked at the uh, chat window to see whether you've posted questions. I suspect there are a few there already. I will uh, stop in just a couple of minutes and leave time for some questions. Uh, if I can't get to all of them before the end, then I will type up answers and we will get those to all of you afterwards. You know what, Scott, I just wanted to uh, stop well, you. For my last five minutes, I'm going to, yes. Oh, uh, we actually don't have any sure, questions. Uh, so oh, okay. we can just um, move right through. If you have some more content, I'm sure everybody would love to have that. And we'll just go right through until uh, noon here. Okay, great. I'll keep going. Thank um, you. Let me go back one more time to the new page. Let's click on basic diagram once again. And this time I'm going to create a very simple shape. I'm just going to drag a rectangle onto the page. Um, I'm going to make a one change to this rectangle just to simplify something I'm about to show you. I'm going to go to the design tab. And on the design tab, among other things, you can apply changes uh, to the themes associated with a diagram. And I'll, I'll show you close my shape data window. I don't need that for this example. And I'm going to move this rectangle off to the right so that you can see the effect of the themes. Notice how dramatically I can change the appearance of this shape simply by hovering over any of these themes. And uh, you see the, the live preview taking effect here. Maybe you want um, a, a set of bold colors. Maybe you want a, a hand-drawn look. This is one of my favorite parts of Visio 2013 much more apparent in network diagrams and other, other flow charts where you want to have your diagram look like it's not finished. You want to have it look like it's in fact hand drawn so that people can help you with making some changes to it. Notice how the, the lines are uh, sort of wavy. Uh, they look like you drew them on a whiteboard with a marker. I'm actually going to choose this theme, which if I hover over it, says no theme. So I'm, I'm going to basically remove themes from this shape. So it's nothing more than a simple rectangle that is um, here on the drawing page. When you are working, when you are working in Visio, there are three things that are interacting to make Visio do its thing. There is what's referred to as the Visio engine. That's the, the code of Visio itself. That's the main programming at the heart of Visio. There is something called the shape sheet, which I'm about to show you a lot more about in the next few minutes. And then there also are add-ins. I referred earlier to an add-in you don't want, the, blue, the send to Bluetooth add-in. 
but there are many um, add-ins available in Visio. When you start an organization chart in Visio, there's an org chart add-in. It's a little bit of extra software that's, that plugs into Visio automatically. Um, my company makes a process mapping add-in called TaskMap that is uh, an add-in to Visio designed specifically for simply creating process maps. So there are those three components, the Visio engine, the shape sheet, and the add-in code all interact in ways that make Visio do its thing. Well, what I want to show you now is the, the shape sheet, a little part of that magic behind this particular rectangle. I'm going to click the Developer tab, and there's a button for Shape Sheet. Now, every object in Visio has a shape sheet. Every shape on the page, every line on the page, the page itself, and even the document itself. This Visio drawing document has its own shape sheet. I'm going to open the sheet for this shape, this rectangle. And what we see, actually, let me close my other um, the window, so I have exactly two things open here. So let me close drawing two. So we don't need this anymore. And now the only thing open is my diagram with a simple rectangle. Um, once again, let's go to the developer tab and show shape. Now what we're looking at, well, okay, I was trying to get Visio to arrange the windows for me automatically. I'll have to give it a little help here. Um, if I press Control Shift F7, how's that for an obscure function key choice? Control Shift F7, it arranges open windows uh, horizontally on the page. So now I've got my rectangle here, and I've got the shape sheet for that rectangle down below. Now the idea of the shape sheet is it's, it looks kind of like an Excel spreadsheet um, organized into categories. So here's a section called shape transform. We have a cell called width, and we have a value. We have a cell called height, we have a value. There are other sections here. I'll, I'll open some of those, and we'll take a look at a couple of them. But basically, the idea here is everything that affects this shape, or the vast majority of the things that affect this shape are stored here in the shape sheet. Notice the value that says 1 and a half for width. If I type 2, press Enter, watch the shape, notice the rectangle gets wider. If I type 3, it gets wider still. So I, I am choosing to change the shape by altering values in the shape sheet. Let's do the opposite. Let me manually change the shape by dragging the width. And when I let go of the mouse, notice that the value in the width cell is now 2 inches or 1.75 or whatever the case may be. So I can make changes in either place to the shape, and the result is stored in the shape sheet or I can alter the shape sheet and have the, the shape reflect the change. Shape sheet cells can contain either formulas or values. Right now we're set for formulas. Notice the check mark. So let me type a formula. Here's an example of a way that intelligent shapes in Visio have the behavior they do. Right now the width is a fixed value. But let's do this. Let's say equals height. Notice the uh, auto typing or auto text that appears, but I'm just going to type the word height times 2. Press enter. Now the height of my shape is exactly twice, pardon me, the width is exactly twice the height of the shape. Let's prove it. Let me change the height by typing 2 inches and watch the shape when I press enter. The height changed to 2 inches and now the width is twice that. If I put 1.1 for the height, then both the height and the width change. Why? Because the value for the width is now a function of the height of the shape. If I change the height of the shape manually by clicking on it and dragging the height down, notice the width also changes because they're still in lock, they move in lockstep with each other. And here's an important point. If I change the width by dragging the width cell, Notice that the value in the cell width now says 4.69 whatever, so I've manually changed the width and I've overridden the, the, the formula that was there. Sometimes that's exactly what you want. You want a formula that's there temporarily that the user can overwrite by dragging the, the uh, handles on the shape. But what if you don't want that? What if you want to protect that formula? Well, there's a way to do that. It's actually pretty easy. There's a function 
I want to type that there. I want to go back to the width cell here. There's a function called guard. And now I put my formula inside the guard function, height times 2. And if I change the value, just to prove that this still works, so the formula works. And if I change the value of the height manually by dragging, the width still changes. But notice what happens when I try to drag the width. Notice that I'm not able to do that. I can't make it wider. I can't make it narrower because we've guarded that width cell. So you have a lot of flexibility in creating shapes like this and altering values. There are lots of other things you can do with the shape sheet. Um, perhaps we'll have a part two of becoming a Visio Power user, and we'll spend a lot more time looking at the shape sheet and shape sheet functions and values. Uh, we could also look at uh, macro programming and, and uh, Visual Basic for applications. Let me just wrap up with a couple of final slides. If you're interested in more information about Visio, I've got some links here. And by the way, Brittany uh, told me before that we started that she'll put all of these links into the follow-up email, so you don't have to furiously scramble to write them down. There is a Visio topic area at Experts Exchange. That's where I and a number of other Visio experts hang out. We're happy to answer your questions. The uh, Visio marketing team at Microsoft is actually pretty active on Twitter. They're uh, at MS Visio. You'll, uh, you'll see a lot of postings about Visio events and Visio uh, tips and tricks. There is a Facebook page. There's also a, a very active Visio enthusiast group on LinkedIn, another place to uh, hang around with some other Visio experts, or Visio novices for that matter. Um, there is the Visio page at Microsoft. The product team at Microsoft writes a great blog about Visio. I would definitely recommend uh, checking that out. Whether you're very technically inclined or a total newbie to Visio, you'll find a lot of good information there. If you are a developer, there are a couple set of text resources. The second one is a set of training resources for Visio developers. Um, and I wrote an article about some of what we talked about today. I actually wrote this a couple of years ago. It's posted at Experts Exchange. My book is available, as Brittany mentioned earlier, both my earlier book, Visio 2010 Step-by-Step, Step, and Visio 2013. My website there will give you some more information. And if you have any questions, please uh, email me, scott at visiostepbystep.com, and I would be happy to answer questions for you. Uh, with that, it looks like we're right at the end of the hour. Uh, Brittany, uh, you can let me know if there are any questions that have popped up in the last couple of minutes. Otherwise, uh, thank you all very much. All right. Thank you so much, Scott, for our, that excellent presentation. We do have, let's see, probably about three or four questions. Um, we can take them now if you have time, or we can, um, I'll send them to you and I'll, and then I'll send the answers out, whichever you prefer. Um, well, tell you what, why don't we do both? I certainly am willing to spend a couple of minutes, and if anybody sure. would like to hang around, feel free to do so. But for anybody who has to leave, uh, we'll, we'll provide them with written answers afterwards. That's so kind of you to share your time. So the first question would be, have you ever made a power distribution system in Visio before? I'm trying to read from a database and get shapes to change based on values from the database, but running into several different problems. One having problems getting the .dwg files into .vsd. I don't want to redraw all the layouts from scratch. Two, data graphics make for very limited functionality. Three, I'm unable to make logic relationships between the shapes. Um, okay, wow. That's, that's about an hour's worth of answers. <laughs> or answers okay. To those questions. Um, let, me just touch, let me just touch on a couple of them, and I, I will provide a little bit more information uh, in, in, a, you know, in a written response. Um, Great. The reference to DWG, for those of you who might not be familiar with that, that is the file format for uh, a very popular CAD drawing package called AutoCAD. Many people use AutoCAD to draw floor plans or building layouts. Um, what a lot of people like to do is be able to bring those floor, floor plans from AutoCAD into Visio and then take advantage of uh, the capabilities of Visio to um, do things like add data to shapes. Uh, I have a client, for example, whose, whose business is managing printers for their customers. So their, their customers import their floor plans, 
and then they use Visio to drag the printers onto the floor plans. And Visio is smart enough, with a little bit of software we helped with, to not only know which room each printer is in, but it, it, uh, those printers are linked to a database, very much like what this questioner is, is asking about, I think, so that if the toner runs out in a printer, the printer turns red on the Visio diagram. Um, that involves quite a, you know, a handful of steps. Number one, getting that, that drawing, uh, that AutoCAD drawing into Visio in the first place, and there are some techniques involved there. I can, uh, I'll, I'll provide links to some helpful resources for doing that. Second is the uh, connection of shapes on a Visio page to a data source. That data source could be Excel, it could be a SQL Server database, it could be any of a variety of other types of data sources. That's a, a relatively straightforward thing to do in most cases. And then once you've got the diagram or shapes in the diagram linked to data, it's very common to want to be able to visualize that data. And the caller or the questioner asks about something called data graphics, which are a great way to visualize data. Um, any one of those three things is, is probably worth 20 minutes to half an hour. Um, so I, I will provide some resources in, in a, a written uh, follow-up set of answers. But uh, all of what you're asking about is possible. I can certainly understand if you've run into some frustrations in, in making all of it work together. You're asking about some pretty sophisticated things. Very possible, but, but quite sophisticated. OK. Thank you. And we'll take one more. And there's a few more questions, but um, we do have to wrap up here pretty soon. Okay, so I'll sure. just uh, let you know the next one. Can you add logic to shapes, primarily to connectors, uh, for example, two circles with a lightning bolt connecting the two? Can the bolt have an electric current properties, for example? Um, yes. Wow. You, you, this is this is an amazing collection of people. Clearly, these are people <laughs> who are uh, heading for heading for being power users because these are Great. not uh, trivial questions. Um, yes, you can. Uh, a, a, any Visio shape can have logic associated with it. That does involve writing some pro, you know, doing some programming. Uh, but shapes can can not only have logic associated with them; they can react to changes in the diagram. So, for example, that lightning bolt, uh, if it's not glued on one end to another shape, it does one thing, maybe it's one color or uh, has one set of attributes, but as soon as it detects that it's been glued onto another shape, it can take on different attributes. Um, pointing the shape, or, you know, that, can, that lightning bolt connector um, from left to right might cause it to do one thing, orienting it from right to left might cause it to do something else. All of that's possible. That's, that's, unfortunately, most of that is well beyond the subject of today's discussion because it does involve doing some programming to add that extra logic and intelligence. But very possible. 